It's amazing to me that the number one brain guy on the planet was the boy with the broken brain and the, the young man who literally lied that he didn't do his extra credit report and throws it in the trash because he didn't want to get up and speak in front of 30 other kids in class is one of the most prolific public speakers in the world. I was getting emotional telling this story. So just tell them, tell them the story you know I'm asking about. And I had an accident when I was five years old, a very bad fall in kindergarten class. I went head first into an iron grade radiator and, and that's where I became very shut down. When I was nine years old, I had processing issues. So teachers would have to repeat themselves over and over again in order for me to, to understand. And I was being teased one day and the teacher came to my defense. She pointed to me and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with the broken brain. And so that label became my limit. In high school, what you're referring to is I was failing high school English and they called my parents in and that was so embarrassing, but I was so much pressure. And in this, you know, with the teacher, my parents, me, she was explaining to me, to my parents, how I was just, I was gonna fail. So she offered to give me extra credit and to do a book report on Albert Einstein. And I was like, I'm gonna do this. So every day after school, I would go to the library. So after doing that for weeks, I was so proud of this final product uh, because I just did so much towards the end of the class. I can't wait to hand it in. The teacher says, okay, class, we have a surprise for all of you. Jim, come to the front of the class and give your book report. Now, I didn't know I had to speak on this book report and I was so scared, I was phobic. So I couldn't breathe. I lied, I said I didn't do it to the teacher and from the whole class. After the class ended, I remember getting up from my desk, walking over to the doorway, and on the way out, I reached into my book bag, I took out the professionally bound book report, and I threw it in the trash that was sitting you know, by the doorway. Gosh. And I think I felt like I was throwing out, I don't know, hope, my potential, my worth. It's, it's funny though, right? Because Ed, my two biggest challenges growing up were learning and public speaking. And life has a sense of humor because yeah. all I do is public speak on this thing called learning. Yeah. And it's just a reminder to everybody that our struggles can be strengths. At difficult times, they can distract you or diminish you or they can develop you. I believe one of the most important parts to having fulfillment, greater levels of success, is knowing yourself. And everybody hearing this, the reason I wanted you to hear that story is because it is true that in life you're most qualified to help the person that you used to be. And Jim is, is living proof of that. Hey, it's Ed Mylad. I just wanted to thank you for being here, and I would ask you to please subscribe to the show. If you just click the subscribe button here, I would really appreciate it. It helps the show grow so we can get even more successful guests on the program to help you. At the same time, if you're subscribed, you're going to get access to the programs before anybody else in the world gets access to them. So if you would, click subscribe right here. Thanks so much. All right, welcome back to the show, everybody. Today is a treat for me because I have a friend here. And not only just a friend, it's somebody that I really admire in my personal life. He's always the smartest man in the room, yet he never has the need to make you feel like you need to know that. His level of humility is so inspiring to me because he's become such a successful man. But He's a coach to so many famous people, celebrities, uh, actors, entertainers, behind the scenes, on their brain, on their life. He's been somebody who's helped me with my own life. Every time I see him, I just want to give him a hug, tell him how much I love him. He's just a tremendous human being. And having said all of that, he's also a brilliant man. And he's one of a kind. And we're going to dial right into one of his great strengths today, which is your brain and how it functions and how you can get it functioning better. I can't think of a topic I'm more excited about covering with the best in the world. So Jim Quick, welcome back for the second time to the show, brother. It's been too long. Yeah, Ed Milet, thank you so much for having me on your show, and thank you everyone who's tuning into this uh, brainy conversation. Well, here's his book, everybody. It's the expanded version of Limitless, and I have to tell you, if you look at me holding it up, you're, most of you listen listening to this on audio, but there's just pages marked after marked after marked for my own usage because it's so... Jim's been on before, and we talked a little bit about this, but this time I got to read the entire book in this expanded version today. You guys, it's really a textbook on your brain and how to get it to optimize to your full potential. And we're going to talk about that on today's show. So let's start with this. I just took a quiz right before I came online here that's okay. in the book about the different brain types. It turns out I'm a cheetah. 
What are okay. you, by the way? And then explain to them what the heck this means. Because I think even understanding your own brain and what type yeah. you are gives you a lot of insight on how to make it optimal. So I am an, an elephant. Uh, okay. my, my, it's my primary. My secondary is an owl. And uh, yeah, we'll talk about for people just tuning in, they're wondering, like, what does that even mean? Right. Um, so we created as part of the new expanded edition, creating momentum in your life. I believe one of the most important parts to having fulfillment, greater levels of success is knowing yourself. I think mm -hmm. a big part of our own success and fulfillment is having the curiosity to know ourselves, And then the other part is having the courage to be ourself, which is a mm -hmm. totally different game. So I created this assessment for people who want to know themselves a little bit better and know the people around them. I pulled from, it's a cognitive type assessment, uh, which only takes about four minutes to go through. And I pulled inspiration from things like uh, personality types, like Myers-Briggs, mm -hmm. uh, science and psychology is like left brain, right brain dominance theory, visual auditory kinesthetic processing. We pulled from multiple intelligence theory, Howard Gardner's work out of Harvard University, introvert, extrovert, and so on. And uh, I realized that after 32 years as being a full-time brain coach, that not everything works for everybody. Just mm -hmm. like uh, we're all bio-individual and not everybody reacts to every food the same way. And just like there's personalized medicine based on an assessment, like your, like your DNA, or uh, personalized nutrition based on a nutrient profile or maybe your, microbi uh, your microbiome test. Uh, we created this simple test for personalized learning and performance based on our dominant brain type. And so there are four brain types. We found out that are four, four buckets. And once you know yourself, you can le really lean into your strengths and leverage them, uh, not only for reading faster, improving your memory, having better focus, but also for negotiating, for sales, for mm -hmm. parenting. You know, once you mm -hmm. understand other people's brain types, it really informs your your next moves, if you will, to have greater levels of learning and 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 life. And so, what's the what's the difference between a cheetah and an elephant, for example? Yeah. Those two types. Yeah, let's let's go through all four. There, there are yeah. four animals. Um, I I'm like the king of acronyms, so I love uh, it. Shortcuts. <laughs> code. Remember your brain code. C O D E. The C stands for cheetahs and cheetahs, their primary trait is action. Like you are a man of action. Mm -hmm. So cheetahs think and act at lightning speed. They thrive mm -hmm. in fast paced environments. They adapt, mm -hmm. uh, making very quick decisions. Uh, they, they trust their instincts. They have extremely strong intuition and they're able to adapt in rapidly changing environments. They're very, mm -hmm. very swift. The O in code stands for the owl and the owl, their dominant trait where cheetahs go for action, owls are go for logic. Okay. So they're very analytical, methodical, detail oriented. And by the way, we are not just one, we are a composite of all these animals, but usually mm -hmm. there's one that's a primary that's more dominant. So the owl sure. are your deep thinkers. They, uh, they analyze information. They consider every angle before making a decision. They love facts and they love figures. They love data. The D in code are your dolphins. And these are interesting people. They mm -hmm. are, their primary trait is creativity. They mm -hmm. are creative visionaries. Uh, they, um, they see the bigger picture. Maybe other people can yet grasp this vision. They're guided uh, a lot by their innovation, by their pioneers in their field. Uh, think about the Walt Disney's, the J.K. Rawlings in the world. And finally, mm -hmm. the E in code are your elephants. And their primary trait is empathy and collaboration. So elephants are at the heart of any team, any friend group. Mm -hmm. They have keen sense of empathy, which allows them to understand and collaborate with a diverse group of individuals. They often serve as the glue that holds teams together. Mm -hmm. They um, they want people to feel seen. They want people to feel heard. Uh, and it's interesting when we had, I, this is a model. And remember, all models are, we know that the the map is not the territory, that the menu is not the meal. Right. But it gives you distinctions and a lens to look at your performance and the decisions you make. Also, the people around you, and it kind of takes a judgment out of it, even with something like speed reading, which we've talked about in a previous mm -hmm. episode with you about memory improvement. I realized that it's not how smart somebody is. It's not how smart you are. It's how are you smart? It's not Gosh. how smart your kids are. It's actually how are they smart? 
and everybody expresses genius in in different ways. You would think that even your career paths, uh, owls, if their brain animal type is an owl, they these are your data analysts, these are your engineers, these are your accountants, these are your research scientists, your software developers. Cheetahs are your entrepreneurs, right? They mm-hmm. adapt, they have strong intuition, they're action oriented mindset. Could be also a uh, cheetah. Could be an EMT or a sale or a sales, a professional athlete like Serena Williams. Dolphins would be uh, find roles, responsibility where the hat of like a graphic designer or maybe a writer, a marketing specialist, a film director. Elephants would fall in in the maybe they're a social worker, a PR specialist, a teacher, a project manager. Well, I think also, Jim, it helps getting people on the right seat on the bus when you're hiring, too, or moving people around. Like, you know, for me, I was I was doing this. I'm like, I need to give this to my team because I have a funny feeling. I have a few people on the bus. They should be on my team, but I have them in the wrong seat based on their brain proclivity. I have them in the wrong seat. Very, very, it, very much so. And so we could use this. We, we have companies. We serve half of the Fortune 500 companies, and they, 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 they apply this to be able to communicate better, to be able to sell better, to be able to hire better in the area or even parent better. But certainly for hiring, a cheetah, think about hiring. A cheetah tends to value efficiency and results. Uh, mm-hmm. So they might lean towards hiring candidates who demonstrate initiative. The candidates yeah. that could quickly adapt, which is one of the most important, uh, you know, traits nowadays. Yep. Uh, people who are decisive, they would manage. Uh, cheetahs would manage a very specific way too. They're great at delegating tasks uh, to set. They set clear expectations. Uh, KPIs, uh, they might need to ensure that they're not pushing their team maybe too hard or too quickly. Yep. And so there's, it definitely informs an owl. You think about it, hiring as an owl, they would appreciate candidates who exhibit strong analytical skills, uh, attention to detail, syst- uh, more systematic approaches. They would manage uh, in a more structured, predictable work environment. And they you- might need to be a little cautious also by, because every, every strength also has a, uh, coupled with is some kind of maybe drawback that they might have a, a cognitive bias or blind spot for. Well, that so was me. To... I, I got to jump in and tell you that one of my yeah. biggest mistakes I made young was I hired people that were my brain type because I mm. thought they were the smart ones. So everybody around me was a, was a, was a, was a doggone cheetah yeah. and I needed some dolphins. I needed some elephants, right? Yeah. I didn't, I, I thought, well, the smart people are just like me. So I had a, you know, that's not the right seat on the bus. I don't think you want your CFO to be a cheetah, right? <laughs> exactly. It's yeah. like love languages. If somebody had their love language, people tend to whatever their love language happens to be, that's what fulfills them. But that's also how they often communicate. So yes. words of affirmation. But if your partner loves acts of kindness uh, or service, then it's it's like we're not meshing. And that happens no. all the time when we're trying to learn something. Often a coach or a mentor is different than, so you have to be able to adapt. Like for So for an owl, their drawbacks, they can be overly cautious and overanalyze and become mm-hmm. too rigid in the process and never take action. They're just ideate all the time. Dolphins can inspire very well because they have a lot of passion because they have this yep. vision uh, where they may motivate teams with their enthusiasm. However, However, they might occasionally overlook the details, uh, the nitty gritty logistics of, of things. And finally, the elephant, if you're thinking about hiring and managing candidates uh, that an elephant would hire for are team players, right? However, you know, a drawback might be they might occasionally struggle with making tough decisions that might upset somebody also also as well but mm-hmm. it's it's interesting once you understand your brain type and people could go through the quiz online or they through the book it also determines how you could parent or or even communicate let me ask you this so when we go through the brain one of the things about jim's work is like it helps you hack your brain and for me because i am a cheetah wanting to be productive right like i want to be productive and i i think sometimes i lose my ability to retain information and to stay focused. So I'm reading, I read this again, and these are just things that stuck out for me that I want people to know on the brain. Like literally, you guys, we could do an hour and a half in the book and I give you hacks in the, that are in the book, which we're going to do now, and it still wouldn't be 20% of the book. There's mm-hmm. that much in there, okay? So I'm going to tell you something that will shock you about him. And I said, one, he's introverted, and two, got to tell you the story from when he was a little boy. And I could yes. see my son getting emotional, and I was getting emotional telling this story but I think in some way, every person can kind of relate a little bit. So just tell them, tell them the story you know I'm asking about. 
Yeah, and I'll, I'll build up to just the 30 seconds before that. I mentioned I had an accident when I was five years old, a mm -hmm. very bad fall in kindergarten class. I went head first into uh, an iron grade radiator and and that's where I became very shut down. My parents said before I was very energized and very curious, uh, very mm -hmm. playful, but I just emotionally, socially just isolated myself. I mentioned mm -hmm. the migraines and the sensory balance issues. I was never picked for sports ever. I was always the last one that a team had to have. And mm -hmm. and uh, when I was, it took me th three years longer to learn how to read, which I mentioned. When I was nine years old, I had processing issues. So teachers would have to repeat themselves over and over again mm -hmm. in order for me to, to understand. And I was being teased one day more than others, uh, other days. And the teacher came to my defense. She pointed to me and said, leave that kid alone. That's the boy with the broken brain. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I didn't know I was broken. And adults have to be very careful of their external words because they often become a child's internal words, right? Mm -hmm. And so that label became my limit. So every single time I did badly in school, I would say, oh, because I had the broken brain. Wasn't picked for sports, oh, I had the broken brain. So that, that was tough. But because of it, my superpower, mm -hmm. I talk about superpowers a lot, um, mostly because I got exposed to comic books and they, they taught me how to read something about the illustrations. It, it just kind of bypassed and helped me understand in my learning language and superheroes offer hope and help. And one person can make a difference. I loved all those themes. Right. And I would mm -hmm. escape in those comic books because I was in a lot of pain. You know, my parents, uh, they immigrated to the United States and my dad lost both his parents at 13 couldn't afford to feed him. We live in the back of a laundromat that my mom worked out and everybody has their own story. That's but for me, that story. was like superheroes just was my, my escape and uh, my inspiration. But going back to that, my superpower growing up was being invisible. Like even talking about it, I could feel it in my voice. Like mm -hmm. I would compress myself so small, punch my shoulders in, collapse my diaphragm because I didn't want to take up a lot of space because I never wanted to be called on in class right because i never knew the answer and i would always like sit behind the tall kid i would you know get sick before every quiz or test i would be sent to the nurse's office and it wasn't just like it was just it was a big challenge um mm -hmm. and so I, I my superpowers it was being invisible but because of it i would just watch people and i would be able to detect suffering because i know what it feels like and also i wanted to be very quiet because i didn't want to be bullied you know that day mm -hmm. or you know picked on and so um, this is every day through school. It was elementary school, um, middle school, junior high. In high school, what you're referring to is I was failing uh, high school English. Mm -hmm. And they called my parents in, and that was so embarrassing because I'm the oldest of, of three siblings. I want to be a good role model. Uh, my parents, they sacrificed a lot, had many jobs. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's probably why I had so many head injuries as a child. I wasn't very well supervised. Mm -hmm. And, um, but I was so much pressure. And in this, you know, with the teacher, my parents, me, she was explaining to me, to my parents, how I was just, I was going to fail. And I begged her to be able to give me a second chance, give me some kind of opportunity to make up for it. Cause I was very hardworking. That was the frustrating part. I would mm -hmm. work three times harder than everyone. I mean, we, that was you know, how I was raised, but I couldn't keep up. And um, so she gave, offered to give me extra credit to do a book report on Albert Einstein and, you know, pretty smart guy. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to, I'm going to show this class, the teacher, my parents that I'm, I'm worth this. So every day after school, we would go, I would go to the library. This is before internet. Right. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I would spend hours there. And so after doing that for weeks, I was so proud of this final product uh, because I just did so much. I found out, by the way, Einstein had his own set of learning challenges, right? Mm -hmm. And he learned differently than than people around him. And so that gave me inspiration. But the day it was due, Ed, um, my parents surprised me and had it professionally bound. And when I saw it, I was just so excited to hand it in. And throughout class, class wasn't until later in the day. I was just, I, I was always thinking about was handing this piece in to the teacher and uh, class comes towards the end of the class. I can't wait to hand it in. The teacher says, okay, class, we have a surprise for all of you. Jim, come to the front of the class and give your book report. Now, I didn't know I had to speak on this book report. I was just, I just thought I had to write it and be able to turn it in and get my extra credit. And, uh, and I was so scared. It's not like, I'll have, I know public speaking is a big fear for everyone, but I'm phobic, I was phobic. 
So mm. I couldn't breathe. Like my heart's beating out of my chest and I'm shaking, panicking. And I spit out, I, I lied. I said I didn't do it to the teacher in front of the whole class. And you can see her disappointment there also as well. Mm. And um, after the class ended, I was the only one there. And I remember, it's like it was yesterday. I'm getting choked up even thinking about it getting up from my desk, walking over to the doorway. And on the way out, I reach into my book bag. I took out the professionally bound book report and I threw it in the trash that was sitting, you know, by the doorway. Gosh, and I think I felt like I was throwing out, I don't know, hope, my potential, yeah. my worth. And that, yeah. that was kind of the place I lived in. A lot of self-doubt, a lot of embarrassment, shame, uh, fears. And it's it's funny though, right? Because Ed, mm -hmm. the, my two biggest challenges growing up were learning and public speaking. Crazy. <laughs> and life has a sense of humor because yep. all I do is public speak on this thing called learning. Yep. And it's just a reminder to everybody that our struggles can be strengths, yep. that um, that difficult times they could distract you or diminish you, or they could they could develop you. You know, it's, we we it, always decide. It's amazing to me that the number one brain guy on the planet was the boy with the broken brain and the the young man who literally lied that he didn't do his extra credit report and throws it in the trash because he didn't want to get up and speak in front of 30 other kids in class is one of the most prolific public speakers in the world. And everybody hearing this, the reason that I wanted you to hear that story is because it is true that in life you're most qualified to help the person that you used to be. Oh, I love that. I just got and, goosebumps. So yeah, and it's just a fact. Bumps. It's just it's just an absolute fact, and that's not my saying. It's it's been out there forever, but it's a fact. And Jim is is living proof of that. But this uh, this notion of the forgetting curve, yeah, and how your brain really works from a neuroplasticity standpoint, but also your ability to stay focused. Can you explain to them what the forgetting curve is and why it's relevant when we're doing work that matters? While there's a learning curve, there's also a forgetting curve, and the forgetting curve states that when you are exposed to information just once then within two days, 80% of it is forgotten, wow. right? And so what in the nature of our work when it comes to memory training, helping people remember client information, product information, languages, uh, give speeches without notes is about mitigating that, that forgetting curve. Mm -hmm. And when you talked about uh, neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity is this phenomenon, this incredible phenomenon that our brains have to be able to adapt to novelty. It's to, neuroplasticity is driven by two factors, novelty and nutrition. And the reason why neuroplasticity, and you've covered this a lot with mm -hmm. experts on your show, is so important because that means that our brains aren't fixed, like mm -hmm. our shoe size, mm -hmm. that we could grow our memory, our happiness, we could change our thoughts, we could change our routines, our behaviors, our habits, because our brain is more plastic in a positive way because it's malleable. And just like building your, your physical muscles, you have to give it novelty and nutrition. Right, You have to give it some kind of stressor, some kind of workout, and then you have to give it proper nutrition so what you nourish flourishes. Same thing with your, mm -hmm. your mental muscles. So one of the things that we added in the updated version, the expanded version, besides the, the cognitive types and all the applications towards learning and leadership and sales mm -hmm is uh, nootropics. And I've never mm -hmm. covered that in 30 years. But yeah. These are supplements that could help boost your focus, your memory, your mood, your mental energy also as well. But that that's how you create neuroplasticity. And so while we could get older, we could always learn. And so it's not true that the older we get, kind of teaching an old dog new tricks is, is absolutely a, a, a fallacy. It does require a little bit more work when we're past the age of 25. You know, I'm in, I'm in my 50s, mm -hmm, but so it's much. but it, it's having strategies. And this is the challenge in school. They teach you what to learn, like math and history, science, Spanish. But there's zero, literally zero classes on how to learn. There's no classes on focus, concentration, how to get into a flow state, how to be creative. Uh, no classes on on memory. I would Always thought it should have been the fourth R in school. They teach you reading, writing, arithmetic, obviously spelling. Those are spelled not with an R. Uh, this is not one of them. But what about mm -hmm. retention, right? Socrates said learning is remembering. And so we want to be able to fill in those gaps for every people of every, every age and stage of life. Let's talk about remembering. So you're going down the road I wanted to go down. One of the other things I talk a lot about is the RAS. Yeah. So I'm rereading the book. This is like, I don't know, two weeks ago. And there's this little blurb in the book where you say, the question, the questions are the answer. Yeah. And it's kind of an RAS hack. This is huge for 
those of you that want more retention, want more focus. So explain that to them, Jim, because this is yeah. right up my alley and a, and a use of the RES that I'd not thought of before. So primarily our brain is a deletion device, right? So it's, it's trying to keep information out at any given time. There are millions, if not a billion different stimuli we could focus on externally or internally. And if we let all that in, we would go insane. We'd be completely overloaded and overwhelmed. And yep. so what we pay attention to, our RAS kind of acts like a spotlight and draws attention to something that maybe we weren't paying attention based mm -hmm. on something that's important to us. Like hardwired into our reticular activating system is our name. That's why names are so important because it's one of the early things that we learned, uh, you know, when we we're children, probably one of the very first words we learned, we heard one of the first words we learned how to write and think about the the love and, and the encouragement most people were given uh, around their name. Mm -hmm. That's why they say a name is the sweetest sound to a person's ears. So mm -hmm. that, that is part of your RAS. If you're, I was running a marathon years ago in Washington, DC. And I remember at the 18th mile, somebody was shouting my name, Jim, right? Very common name. And I know, I didn't know the person, but I still looked because I'm wired to look because my RAS allows that in. So one of the ways of, of so good. stacking and, and utilizing your RAS is by asking questions. So questions shine a spotlight on the things that are important to us. So as an example, uh, years ago, a long time ago, my younger sister would send me emails and postcards of a very specific breed of dog a pug dog, right? Okay. And uh, I, my question was, why does she keep on sending me all the dozens and dozens of photos of pug dogs? And I realized that her birthday was coming up and she was, she was a great marketer and she was seeding <laughs> her gift, right? <laughs> and a funny thing happened, Ed, is I started seeing these pug dogs everywhere. everywhere. I, I would be at the health food store and the person in front of me, I swear, is holding a pug dog yeah. ready to 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 pay the register. I was jogging in my neighborhood and there's this guy walking six pug dogs. Now my question for every single person listening is, did those pug dogs law of attraction just magically pop into my neighborhood? They teleport and manifest around me. No, they were always there, but my brain was deleting it because that wasn't important until I started asking the questions. And then I start seeing these pug dogs everywhere. Even a basic study tip is you read all these reading comprehension, all these paragraphs, maybe multiple pages, and then you get 10 questions at the end that the, the testers want you to be able to answer. Well, the first and foremost, you should read those questions first, right? Because mm. you don't want to get to the end of reading, you know, multiple pages on a time test and then say, oh, that's what was important. Then you ask the questions at the end first. And then all of a sudden when you're reading it, you're like, oh, there's an answer, there's an answer, there's an answer. And it just makes it more seamless like even how we design the book it's not just teaching you accelerated learning speed reading memory improvement focus flow uh but it's also it's also structured in a way like every chapter starts with three questions yeah. right to get people's ras engaged so when okay. they're reading they're looking for those answers specifically okay that's brilliant that is brilliant right there okay so everybody you're teaching something to someone and you're trying to retain information. It's the questions that guide that light in your RAS to find the answers. Here's the other thing I've always struggled with, and I know the answer now because it's in the book, but I want you to give it to everybody or one of them. I had a hard time in college, particularly during lecture, where I would write notes yeah. and then I'd remember nothing. And then a lot of the people listening to my show go to events. They go to business events. They're taking notes the entire time. And I know this because I host events and I speak at a lot of them. The retention level, I think even most people listening to this would be honest to say, is very, very low. So one of the things in the book, you actually teach hacks on how to properly take notes. Yes. And this is stuff, you guys. This will help the students in your life. This will help those of you that are trying to learn and grow. Here's how I know this is big. Sasha, my producer, just leaned in as I asked that question <laughs> because people want to know this because it's something everybody relates to. I've gone back and looked at notes from meetings that are two and three years ago in my life, brother, and I'm like, I have no recollection of writing this down. I have no recollection of anything this person just said. And I even noticed this with my son. He's a really, really good golfer. When you play golf, Jim, with someone who's a great golfer, you and I have talked about golf quite a bit, actually, and my son can remember every shot on every single hole that he's played. I can't. I could play a golf course on a Saturday, come back on a Sunday. I don't even remember the fourth hole. And one of the reasons, I believe, is my son is taking notes on his round as he plays it, 
and it upgrades his retention. So give us some note-taking tips and hacks for retention. So as you mentioned, you and I, we we produce events, we speak on the same stages, and mm -hmm. we know that with the forgetting curve, if they hear a speaker just once within a couple of days, most of it is gone, 80% at least. And then over yes. time, it just uh, it just, it just just disappears for a lot of people. And one of the ways of mitigating that is by taking proper notes. Now, it's interesting because people could take digital notes or handwriting notes, but mm -hmm. when university students are tested for the things that matter, comprehension and retention of the information, Mm -hmm. then actually handwriting notes uh, by far uh, get performs better for both understanding information and retaining information. Okay. I would say also one of the reasons like digital note taking is great for storage and sharing information. But if you can do the handwriting notes first and then digitize it, or you have a device that allows you to take notes and it digitizes it automatically, uh, then that's preferred. Uh, but the reason, one of the reasons why is most people could type pretty fast and you could okay. probably type and transcribe as fast as Ed and I are speaking, but nobody can handwrite notes that fast. Okay. So part of handwriting notes, one of the reasons why it's more effective is it forces you to, to filter the information, to organize it and prioritize the information because you're not writing every single word down. Right. Mm. Even when university students are tested, the actual worst way of taking notes besides not taking notes is full transcription. The mm. best way is having key ideas and key thoughts, so, you know, and maybe putting it and capturing it in a way like uh, more whole brain, like mind mapping is a very famous way of using both your left and right brain. I have a very simple way that anybody, a lot of people won't, they won't grasp mind mapping because it has colors and it looks a little bit too creative. Uh, mm -hmm. So if you're not a dolphin, maybe it doesn't really yeah. mesh with you. Then I would say simple way of taking notes is take a piece of paper and a few people happen to be watching this video, I'll just illustrate yeah. it. But just, you don't even have to see this. Put a line right down the page. Mm -hmm. And on the left side, I want you to capture. On the right side, I want you to create. Now, that's very, very subtle. So on the left side, the things we're talking about here, what are the best brain foods? What are the top entropics to, to boost your, your focus and your productivity? How do you read faster, right? That would that, That's your capturing. But okay. if your mind is going to wander, your right brain is going to search for entertainment elsewhere, I'd rather it go on the right side of the page instead of thinking about other things. Okay. So what you're going to write on the right side is you're going to write your impressions of what you're capturing. So I'll say it in a different way. On the left side, you're capturing, you're note taking. On the right side, you're creating, you're note making. And so mm -hmm. it's a very, very subtle difference, but you're on the right side, you're writing your impressions of what you're capturing. So maybe you're putting things like, how does this relate to what I already know? How can I use this? When mm -hmm. will I use this? What questions do I have? You know about this uh, about this subject matter and mm. so that's a very left brain right brain more whole brain way of taking notes it's very simple very and i feel like uh it's so important nowadays most of your listeners have forgotten more about personal growth and wellness and and success than most of their friends and family have right mm. and they're probably thinking like you know but you still need to keep it elegant taking mm. complex information i'll read all the white papers but i always realize that education doesn't really get the result. If you can mm -hmm. make it super simple, like what is the tiniest action I could take right now that will give me progress towards this goal where I can't fail. And this is something so simple Very and good. the return is so, the reward is so huge. What about teaching something? So mm -hmm. when you leave an event, is it healthier for retention if say you go home and your boyfriend or girlfriend or your spouse says, hey, what did you learn there? To actually yeah. download and teach them what you learned. Do I've always felt like I retain more when I teach, or is that a fallacy? Or or is there some accuracy to that? Yeah, it's absolutely true. They call it the explanation effect. The explanation effect basically states exactly what you said. When you learn something with the intention of teaching somebody else, you're gonna learn it so much better. Mm -hmm. And so even when people are listening to this episode, why wait? Do it right now. Think about if you had to think about somebody you wish was listening to this, and obviously they should post it and share it and and, mm -hmm. and, spread, and spread your podcast. You know, uh, I Please. mean, every, I think everyone listens to your podcast already. But if they had to give a TEDx talk the following week, would there would they focus better? Of course they would. Would they take mm -hmm. better notes? Of course they would. Would they post mm -hmm. more questions on social media? Of course they would. They would mm -hmm. own that information. So when you teach something, you get to learn it twice. Mm -hmm. And that's the uh, explanation effect. So it's a Gosh. wonderful way of accelerating your learning. Okay. So I'm going to ask you a dual question. I want to go back to something you said earlier because I you finished it and then I was so excited to ask you the next question. But this nootropics idea, 
there's a couple things in the book that are new. The nootropic stuff I'd like you to talk about. And this is going to sound disconnected, but to me it's like nourishment. So I'm going to ask yep. both questions together and then you can go. You also talk about the second brain mm -hmm. in the book. The yep. second brain being the gut. So talk about nourishment. And I, I, I'm just going to throw the, the ball at you and let you kind of kick it around and answer it back. But you know why I'm asking them together. One, what nootropics do you recommend if you do? I know mm -hmm. you do, but what if you do? And then tied into that, because it's like kind of nourishment for the brain, so to speak. Yeah. What about this second brain aspect as well with, with your gut? So, I mean, everyone can imagine like their brain is the leaves of a tree and then going down in the soil is and the roots are coming from your gut. And so your second brain is incredibly wise. But if it's clogged up with all this processed foods, high sugar food, refined foods, uh, lots of ingredients that we don't even know how to pronounce, and then there could be some issues there. There are certain foods, every ingredient that we talk about, we talk about the best brain foods, but also we added a new chapter. The new book's all about momentum. You know, it's, it's all, mm -hmm. we talk about mastering your mindset, your motivation, how to overcome procrastination. I have a formula for that. Mm -hmm. um, and then also the methods for accelerated learning, speed reading, memory enhancement, focus flow, and all that. Jeez. And the focus of the new book was really about momentum. And so knowing your brain type gives you momentum, right? Mm -hmm. And knowing the brain type of other people allows you to sustain it. Um, AI, we talk about AI improving your HI, your human intelligence, and different ways yep. you could do that to create momentum. And nootropics is, is and this whole area of science called neuronutrition. So there's certain things that ingredients that your brain is only 2% of your body mass, but requires 20% of the nutrients. And some of those nutrients are different than the rest of your body. And mm -hmm. so in no particular order, it, and I would always prefer people get it from foods, but we know how depleted foods are. And sometimes when we're traveling and eating at hotels or fast food, we don't get those nutrients. So mm -hmm. for example, uh, there are brain supplements and there are nootropics, and I'll go through some of some of each. So choline would be a brain supplement. It's a it's a nutrient. You know, it's usually found in eggs and soybeans. It plays a vital role in brain health. It's a crucial component of acetylcholine, which is a neurotransmitter that supports things like memory, things like cognitive function. And so, you know, if you're not getting it from your eggs, then you could supplement with it. Another brain supplement are omega three fatty acids. Mm -hmm. particularly uh, DHA because your brain is mostly fat and DHA is the primary uh, it's the it's the structured component of the brain that plays a key role in memory and overall brain health and function mm -hmm. and so if you're not getting it from wild salmon sardines you might need to supplement so a nutrient profile because I talk about in the book meta learning the art mm -hmm. and science of learning how to learn but th that's the software we still need to take care of the hardware that three pound matter between our ears called our brain and so if you're lacking vitamin d your your, your b vitamins so important especially b6 uh, b9 which is uh, folate b12 it's vital for brain health you, you're not going to be able to get it affects your mood it, it affects every brain function magnesium i mean these are the basic supplements it's so important it's literally responsible for hundreds of physiological problems processes, um, but it affects your learning, your memory, your mood. Um, and, and it could also affect your sleep also as well. The magnesium three and eight has been shown to help people to, to sleep better, but mm. going into the nootropics, some of my favorites, ashwagandha, it's yeah. an adaptogenic herb. Yeah. Um, and again, I'm not a nutritionist or, or a doctor. You could just, but everything we put into the book, I reference all the human studies. Uh, I've noticed, I just study. jump in. Ashwagandha has helped me with like anxiety as well yeah it's, it's incredible yeah. for yeah. it improves mental and physical resilience it ha mm -hmm. can help uh, as you mentioned reduce stress mm -hmm. and anxiety and also improve cognitive function there's a, a nootropic it's a it's a whole coffee fruit extract so mm -hmm. whole fruit from the coffee plant it's usually a byproduct that they throw out but it has it's an extremely strong antioxidant it has a positive impact on cognitive function there's something called phosphatidylserine which is a phospholipid and these are big words but it is so important for for brain cell membranes it's been shown to improve memory learning cognitive function l-theanine is an amino acid it's often found in uh, green tea it's a very popular nootropic it promotes uh, relaxation without the drowsiness and it can enhance uh, brain function what i like about it is if you pair it with caffeine for me i'm very sensitive with caffeine 
personally mm-hmm. and it really could affect my sleep and my my mm-hmm. kind of my give me the jitters but l-theanine helps to to mitigate that and so if you pair with caffeine you, you know it's when in the morning i have to do it in the morning because i can't do caffeine past like 12 or 2 o'clock it gives you more of a relaxed uh alertness if you will mm-hmm. but something that i think that um people don't realize is a popular uh workout supplement called creatine you know, it's a substance that's naturally produced in our body. It's primarily found in meats and fish, but if you're not getting enough of it, it plays a crucial role in energy metabolism, specifically, not just for your muscles, but also your mental muscles. So oh, it, it helps really? you to to create more energy, more brain energy. So for people who, you know, suffer from mental fatigue, a little brain fog, you know, it could improve your cognitive function, especially at t- in tasks that require uh, a really strong short-term memory. Yeah. Um, and quick thinking. So creatine's a, a fun one. Um, we talked about last time some of the foods and turmeric was one of the brain foods, but it's it's the curcumin. Yeah. That that's the active ingredient that has potent anti-inflammatory uh, uh, and antioxidant benefits, very neuroprotective. Many people know I had a traumatic brain injury when I was five years old. Mm-hmm. I was put in special education because I had learning difficulties. I had migraines every single day. I just thought it was normal for kids to just kind of be in chronic pain and I had Mm. balance issues and took me three years longer to learn how to read. And then the last Mm. one I'll mention is uh, lion's mane mushroom. It's getting a lot of, uh, especially the past few years, uh, a lot of, lot of attention. It's a unique nootropic. It has neuroprotective effects. Whole area of science we're talking about, it's called neuronutrition again, but it's been shown to stimulate the synthesis of nerve growth factor, which could enhance cognition by reducing inflammation and promoting overall uh, good brain health. You said something about trauma when you were young, and oh. I'll let you in on something. Both Jim and I are uh, shy. Um, I I think we bond over it. So when we're in green rooms or there's lots of speakers around, Jim and I usually try to find a way to be alone together or we actually get alone because we're both extremely, I think it's safe to say, extremely introverted, both of us, which surprises people because we're both speakers. We're in public Mm -hmm. all the time. And, but um, it's definitely true for me. And I, and I I, I think people are surprised to hear that if they're hearing that from you the first time, because you were like the best speaker on stage. And I think people, but you have to be that expressive because otherwise you want your stories wouldn't land, mm-hmm. right? Um, mm-hmm. Or you won't have the impact that that you you desire and that you know people deserve. Thank you. Um, but yes. Well, I, I think they'd be surprised at that with you. And I think one of the reasons I love Jim one, he's just a kind, gentle, generous, brilliant man. He'll give you the shirt off of his back. He's done things for me. You guys, just so you know, like on short notice, moved things, moved his world around to be there for me. And it's something I've told him I'll never forget and I will never forget. But the other thing that I've never forgotten, if you just share it for a minute, you talk about trauma when you're young, is I picture little Jim in school and he's not doing very well. So he gets a chance to, I think the story is do the extra credit and to do an extra work. This notion of, I think every human being can relate on in their way to this moment that happened to you in your life. And I don't want to tell the story. I want you to tell it because you lived it. But I actually was telling my children, because they knew I was interviewing today for Thanksgiving, I was talking to them about, hey, what do you have coming up? I said, I'm excited. I get to talk to Jim again. And I said, my son really loves Jim's speaking style. It fits my son's personality very, very well. For memory, I want a memory hack here. And I think my new favorite is the storytelling element of remembering things because I, for some reason, it just works with me. I'm sure you know the reason. But everyone here would love to be able to remember words better, names better, whatever it might be. And, and, or, you know, there's an exercise in the book with 10 words and then telling a story. So would you just give us that? I call it a hack, but it's a strategy for recall and memory because jim can go into a room and remember 200 people's names like that it's just insane but give them give them that strategy or a strategy you think that they probably have not heard before yeah so there's this story method here let's 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 make it interactive we can just like into a little kind of like uh i'll test everybody right now let i'll give everybody a list of let's say a list of random words right because if you want to remember languages or vocabulary or speeches, it comes down to words. Can I can I push you and I'm gonna have you do it with Sasha? Can we do it with Sasha right yeah, now? Let's do it. Yeah. Absolutely. Come on in here, Sasha. Mm-hmm. Sasha's getting on my show. Come in here. 
I'm going to put Sasha on. I'm going to watch you do it with Sasha. So Sasha, we're going to um, use a story method. I, you know, we've, we've done the previous episode, how to memorize like foods and speeches. This is a way, uh, and Ed is a master storyteller. One of the reasons why, one of many reasons why he just crushes it on stage and makes everyone knows the stories because they stick in people's minds. I mean, before we had printing presses and everything else, we would remember things through stories right mm-hmm. through the, on, sitting around campfires uh, before all the external technology so let me let, let's i'm gonna give you 10 words to memorize you can do the best you can don't write them oh, down God. <laughs> but um just just however you would normally memorize these 10 words right you ready ready awesome fire hydrant balloon batteries barrel board like a surfboard Diamond. Okay. Sir Lancelot. Mask. Toothpaste. Sign. Okay. All right. So those are 10. Actually, I should memorize this with you. Okay. Yeah, those are 10 words. Now notice, and you're thinking, Jim, shut up so I could like write these down. (laughs) Um, Nobody gets all 10. Very, very, very rarely I'll say some kind of technique. But do you remember some of the words? Fire hydrant. Yes. Battery, balloon, board, Sir Mix-a-Lot, balloon again. <laughs> um, okay. That's it for me. All right. So this is interesting because the other thing I'll teach everybody here when you're listening, we tend to remember. So the first word was fire hydrant. I'll, I'll give you the, the list of words. Fire hydrant, balloon, batteries, barrel, board, diamond, Sir Lancelot, mask, toothpaste, sign. So, and I'll tell you, this is, I'll even give you more than just this method. If you, if people listening here, and I hope they did it with us, if you tend to remember fire hydrant, it's a principle of memory called primacy. We tend to remember things in the beginning of something. If you tend to remember the last word, which was sign, then that means recency. So if you go to a party and you probably remember the first people you met and the last people, the the most recent people, right? Um, What other words did you remember? Balloon. Balloon. Why did you? Why do you think you remember balloon? Um, I think I was like, oh, all these bees. So Perfect. I locked that so one in. Another principle. So what we're pulling out of here are principles of recall. So the first one was primacy. The second one was recency. The other thing is chunking. When you organize, because it went the three. It went balloon, battery, barrel, board, and some people will remember four or three of them because is the alliteration right? B. Mm -hmm. So it's chunking and organizing. We tend to remember things. So if I gave people a list of 20 random words and see how well they did, but then I said, okay, well now these are presidents, state capitals, fruits, and colors. You probably remember more because there's an organization you're looking for. Um, Any other words that stood out for you? I said Sir Mix-a-Lot, but it was Sir (laughs) Lancelot. And that could have been maybe you didn't hear it because I was going kind of quickly or you know, there's always this deletion and a little distortion. We never, mm-hmm. Even when they take expert witnesses, you know, not everybody experiences the same thing. Mm-hmm. But um, other things you might remember are things that you pictured. I don't know if you pictured any of these images. Or some people would remember something like uh, toothpaste because they it's something they use every single day. And that's a principle for memory, familiarity. You tend to remember somebody who uh, has the same name as someone familiar to you, right? Mm-hmm. Um, or if you remember something like a diamond, some people, uh, there's some, some emotional content there that people associate to it. So they're more likely to remember it. Or if I said mask, maybe because people remember masks with the, the pandemic or something, right? So my point in bringing this up, and I'll tell I'll give you the method, is that when we remember something, it's not random. There are There's a principle that's being in play. And if you use those principles for the other things you want to remember, you'll remember a whole lot more. So I'm going to take, like, you notice that, did you, any of these you put together, did you remember like two of them because they kind of like, you linked them together a little bit? Um, 
you know like mm. uh like maybe there was uh you saw them the two of those objects together i tried visually. to link the first two balloon and fire hydrant because well, let, yeah, let, let's do it so let's everybody do this this is so remember this everyone and do this with me and you could close your eyes if it's safe to do so if you're not working out or driving a car and take a deep breath breathe normally helps you focus a little bit there's no such thing as a good or bad memory there's a trained memory and an untrained memory so let's do this I'm going to walk you through this, uh, take the principles of recall and, and turn it into a story. And I want you just to imagine this. And if you can't imagine it, imagine you can imagine it. We'll do it very quick. All right. I want everyone in listening, imagine a fire hydrant in your neighborhood. Even notice what color it is. What color is yours? Red. Great. It's red. And I want you to imagine tied to it is a gigantic helium balloon, a gigantic helium balloon, or many, many big helium balloons tied to it so many that it lifts and tears the hydrant from the ground and water spews everywhere and you look up in the sky and there's this fire hydrant going up in the sky like like kind of up and all these balloons tied to it now out of nowhere a barrage of batteries come and pop the balloon so just imagine it and you should keep your eyes closed if you want it helps you focus but imagine all these batteries notice what brand the batteries what brand of batteries are, are popping the balloon? Duracell. Duracell. This is a branding question. <laughs> so it could be C batteries, Ds, double As, but it's Duracell batteries. And the batteries are coming from this guy that's hiding in a barrel. So just imagine this barrel and that all the battery full of batteries. And the guy's just chucking these batteries out. What makes this barrel unique on the side of it is a surfboard, a board, right? Right on the side. And rolling down the board is a diamond but not like a, a half a carat or one carat diamond it is like a 128 carat diamond it's like the size of a let's say a basketball and it's rolling down the board and it falls off the board the diamond and it hits a knight in the head in his helmet uh sir lancelot all right sir lancelot and it knocks him out cold and you go to save sir lancelot by bringing him a mask an oxygen mask but before you put on the oxygen mask, so imagine you're taking off his helmet, you're putting on oxygen mask, but before you do, you notice the mask is dirty. So you clean it with toothpaste. You're cleaning it with toothpaste before you put it on. So mask, toothpaste, and when the toothpaste is done, you throw it and it goes to a big neon sign and it explodes toothpaste everywhere on this neon sign, right? And maybe the neon sign says uh, limitless, all right? And it just explodes. All right. Now that's a story. We're using some of the principles of emotion, making things a little different. And now what I'd love for everyone to do is start with a fire hydrant. And when I say fire hydrant, what was attached to the fire hydrant? The balloon. The balloons. And what pops the balloons? The batteries. The batteries, the Duracell batteries. And the batteries <laughs> were, there was a guy hiding with the batteries in a what? A barrel. A barrel. And on the side of the barrel was this the surf board right and rolling down the board was a what diamond a gigantic diamond. diamond and the diamond fell off the board and hit who in the head sir lancelot yes and then you bring him in oxygen oh mask. wait so, mask mask yeah, yeah it's all good toothpaste yes. and then sign perfect and then you have all 10 and i bet you could do it backwards too Right, you could go from the, the neon sign, and right uh -huh. before the sign was what? Was the toothpaste? Toothpaste mask. And then before the mask. Uh huh. The Lancelot. So great, great job. Thank you. And so <laughs> thank you so awesome. much. That was a lot of pressure right thank there. You. Yeah, that's, that's that was pressure, definitely not Sasha. definitely not planned. That was pretty good. I, so f I, I'm back there going. I, I, I have some of this. So I was, I could even hear all of them. You got fire hydrant. You got fire hydrant balloons, batteries barrel board i'm skipping some i'm sure but mm -hmm. i didn't even get to hear all the you're barrel right, you're, right, you're right on barrel diamond. board so diamond i think diamond ends up yes. with sir lancelot yep. and like, like that's crazy the mask and the toothpaste and the, mask sign. And the toothpaste and, and, explodes and, into a neon sign that says limitless on it and, and, and here's the thing crazy and i was just in the I'll, background I'll, I'll i got the headphones on Ed, like how you could so use good. this in every day yes let's say let's and it only takes a couple minutes but yeah. let's say that you wanted to memorize something that was just 
back in school, right? Something that's very boring, non-relevant to your life, um, technical. Like what was a, a class that you had to do with some, some of that memorization back in, let's say high school? Like what are some classes that there's just a lot of tech, it's just technical stuff? Oh gosh, algebra. Yeah, like algebra or math or science, yeah. Yeah. right? So if you take something like, um, I don't know, what science did you study back in high school? I'll take biology. Biology, lots of things there, right? Yeah. Yep. Or bio, what was it? Biology, chemistry, chemistry. physics. Yep. Like in chem, in chem, let's say chemistry, right? What was okay. something that people needed to memorize in chemistry? There was that the, big thing on the Periodic wall. table. Yeah. So if people want to apply to memorize a periodic table, right? Yep. Using this story method where you could yep. see it, feel it, some emotion and hear it. Yep. Then all you have to do is is take the things that you want to remember and turn them into a picture or a sound alike. Yep. And so if you know what that element happens to be and what it's used for, you could picture that or something that sounds like it. Kind of like you're playing Pictionary. If you got to get people to say a word and you yep. draw an ear and it says sounds like. So even like this. So the elements are hydrogen, helium, lithium, beryllium, boron, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, fluorine, and neon. And I could be making this up for people, but they're absolutely true. Okay. okay. Jeopardy is my my plan B if this whole speed reading memory thing doesn't work out. <laughs> it does, it's so hydrogen, out. like just think of something that sounds like hydrogen or sound or like close enough to, that mm -hmm. will remind you of, of like a picture that you could picture, something that mm -hmm. sounds like. So for me, hydrant would be like a hydrant. Right. So everyone yeah. could picture that as the first element. Yeah. And then uh, helium is the second one. So what can you picture for helium? What's a picture? Hmm. Like, what can you, what's helium? When I say helium, what do you think of? Oh, you're asking me. Uh, I'm thinking yeah. of an athlete that I know named Thelium. <laughs> yeah. So you can do something sound like, or for yeah. most, a lot of people listening, helium like is used like for balloons, right? Mm -hmm. Helium mm -hmm. balloon. So all the the story method is is taking the fire hydrant and attaching it to the balloon Gosh, to help you remember so the periodic good. table. And then so um, some people are thinking like, oh, this sounds familiar. Um, mm -hmm. The next element is lithium, which is used in batteries. So all you have to do is attach batteries to so the balloons. So imagine a lot of barrage of batteries popping the balloon and the batteries the next one is a beryllium barrel ilium so for me i picture a barrel so imagine a barrel full of batteries popping the balloon that's holding the fire hydrant right and wow. for people listening from before that's the same exact story that we did so so good barrel by the way barrel I... ilium oh, the board is boron what was going down? A diamond made of carbon. That's a six element. It falls on a knight's head. That's nitrogen. You bring him an oxygen mask. Oxygen is the eighth element on the periodic table. And then you clean it with toothpaste, fluorine, like fluoride. Fluorine is the ninth element. And then the toothpaste goes into the neon sign. And neon is the 10th element on the periodic table. Jim, quick. What the heck? I got a, I got a, <laughs> I got a D, I got a D in chemistry in yeah, high school. And by the way, I'll never forget this. Where were you in my life? Do you know how much, you would have just saved me so much stress. I'll never forget this. Anecdotally, everybody, Mr. Park, God bless him. I don't know if he's still alive or not. I remember Mr. Park would sit there because I was an athlete and he would say, Mr. Milet. I remember the direct quote, you were unequivocally the dumbest student I've ever had in chemistry. He would say this to me. And my buddy Rich Fry, if he's listening to this, Rich Fry and Ed Milet are unequivocally the two dumbest students I've ever had in my class. The truth is I wasn't dumb. I just had no memory skills yeah. that I hadn't developed. And it, I, I, I got to tell you something, brother. Every time I'm with you, I learn. And I told you guys this in the beginning. He's the smartest guy in the room who never feels the need to let you know that he is. He makes you feel smart. And so to just to think that the boy with the broken brain becomes this expert is just, it's mind blowing to me. And I hope you guys today, like for me, I've never had Sasha sit in the seat before and put her on. Like, nah. That was incredible. I'm off. I'm off. I, by the way, I always say that I, I know I shouldn't say so loud, that I don't have a great memory. So I'm off camera. I can't even hear all the words and I can go right now to the fire hydrant with the balloons all the way up to the bat. I mean, the battery yeah. in the barrel with the surfboard and then all the way down to Sir Mix, Sir uh, Lancelot who's got the mask on. I mean, it's yeah. just crazy that I can have this memory. It's just and, and, my... and this is, regardless of people's age, we have students in every country in the world. You know, I've been doing this for three decades, and I realize that it's not, again, 
when you understand how your brain works, you can work your brain. When you understand how your memory works, you can work your memory. And there's no such thing as a good or bad memory. There's really just a trained memory and untrained memory. And it's so important in life. You know, I believe two of the most costly words in life sometimes are, I forgot. I forgot to do it. I forgot to bring it. I forgot what I just read. I forgot what they said. I forgot what I was going to say. I forgot to go to that meeting. I forgot that person's name. And so the reason why we made the largest chapter in the book on memory improvement, there's simple techniques to be able to remember client information, product information, give speeches without notes, and and so 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 much more. Because I think memory is a multiplier. It can make every area of your life better. And um, yeah, oh it's a superpower gosh. we all have. I'm just curious. This isn't in the book. Jim's a new dad. He's got a 10 and a half month old at home. Is there something you're doing with your child that we should all know you're doing to give this person the quick brain, the super yeah. brain, that, you, that there's just something you're doing or things you're doing to cultivate this young brain that's developing right now that someone should be doing with their child, their children, they could be doing for themselves, future children are going to have grandchildren. I know you're doing something that we should know about as you've uh, entered. I think baby development, this. and this is a new field for me. I'll pull back and say that I'm in my 50s. This is our, our first child. And I was ready to just teach everything. And I realized yeah. Ed, that I'm learning so much more than I, I feel like uh, teaching, mm -hmm. um, at least at this stage of, of, his, of his life. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the act of being present like this child, this child is like so curious. He just always mm -hmm. looking and trying to figure things out. Mm -hmm. um, also the importance of movement, you know, because mm -hmm. that crawling motion is so important for brain development because mm -hmm. as your body moves, your, your brain grooves. So, you know, I, I would say in no particular order, Okay, movement, I just mentioned. So that's important for sensory integration, uh, important for motor skills, important mm -hmm. for cognitive development. Even there's studies done in the area of educational kinesiology, simple things like if people take their hand or elbow and touch the opposite knee and just kind mm -hmm. of raise your knee and go back and forth, mm -hmm. uh, they're called cross crawls uh, by Brain Gym. I'll do this with, with him you know, first few months, just kind of taking his hand and touching the opposite leg and go back mm. and forth, uh, helps with cognitive development, you know, but my ideas I'm thinking about is social emotional growth, mm. uh, which is so very important. Um, so practical things for movement are like things that we know that are proven like tummy time, uh, mm -hmm. safe exploration space so they could just discover things and just be mm -hmm. fascinated and curious. Interactive play, uh, so very important. Think about how fast children learn because they play so much. And sometimes uh, I said this to an audience recently and they're like, oh, some guy said, I, I stopped playing because I grew older. But it could mm -hmm. be the opposite. Maybe you grew older because you stopped playing, right? Uh... And I like adding play so much to our my uh, speeches and presentations because I feel like we learn best when we don't even realize that we're, we're learning, that we're willing to make mistakes when we play as opposed to, oh my goodness, what's everyone going to think? Children have a lot of the, these mirror neurons and just like adults have it. And mirror neurons, like a mirror that gives you a reflection, allows you to imitate. It creates empathy. So these kind of mimicry games that you could play, like clapping hands or making faces mm. uh, where babies could, could can learn. Um, I'm a big fan of spending more time outdoors also as well and doing some mm. baby yoga or something. But um, frequent talking, verbal interactions, so very important for the, for the baby. If they're not talking and yep. speaking yet in the beginning, yep. okay. giving them ex exposure to different okay. vocabulary, not just the simple stuff, but I mm -hmm. feel like it's also very stimulating. Singing songs, you know, it, it also introduces to the child rhythm and can enhance an infant's ability to distinguish sounds, which is a key component to uh, language learning. Um, my my wife uh, speaks Korean uh, with the mm -hmm. baby, so exposed to both you know languages could help mm -hmm. differentiate languages. And even there have been studies shown that you could even teach potentially where I, I believe genius is not born, it's built because um, everything, nothing's fixed. We stimulate learning all the time. I mean, it's there's interactive engagement, you know, but you don't have to make it so like, because nobody's gonna do it perfect, right? Mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's messy, just like learning is messy, life is messy, but repetition, positive reinforcement, getting on a good routine, especially a sleep routine. Let me tell you where he's helped me a lot. Um, his work has th this new work and I'm processing it because I want to use it and then 
you know, I want to be able to teach it as well. I'll give Jim credit when I do it, but that's getting into flow state. We've all had into flow. We've all had those moments in our life. You've had it on stage, Jim. So have I, where you're like, wow, this is just better than I feel like I really am. We've all had those moments. If you're an athlete or as a mom or a dad or at your work, it's, you're just in that flow state. And I've never really been able to describe very well publicly. I do it privately with my one-on-one coaching, but like, how do you get in there? What is it? What's the, what's the process? What's a hack? And you do. And so I feel like one of the great gifts of my podcast is that people get access to information they should be paying hundreds of thousands of dollars for. And I feel like this bit right here goes, you know, right to that point. So let's talk, I'll just turn it over to you. Talk about flow state for us. Yeah. There's a whole chapter in the the new book on, accessing flow states so let's define it a flow your your flow states are the state where you feel your best and you perform your best i mean Mm -hmm. who doesn't want to spend more time there right Mm -hmm. it's people call it like the zone and where it's just like the the three markers for it uh, to keep it simple uh just remember set set the s is self we lose our sense of self our ego we're not thinking about ourselves or how we look or anything like that the e it really is effort and there's very little effort to get this incredible reward right for this activity and finally the t is time where we lose our sense of time so we lose our sense of self we lose our sense of time and things almost feel almost effortless because mm-hmm. you lose your sense of time where it's like you don't know five minutes or five hours went by and i'm sure mm-hmm. some people listening they've had this experience and uh and i realized that with all kinds of with everything there's always what looks like magic there's always a method behind the magic always when people are succeed in their relationships or their health they look younger they feel great or they're making money they're doing something other people aren't doing right Mm -hmm. maybe you said it like this genius leaves clues success leaves Mm -hmm. clues right Mm -hmm. and so my work is really trying to figure out the method behind what looks like magic even at events where i memorize 100 people's names or 100 random words or numbers forwards and backwards i always tell people i don't do this impress you i do this express you what's possible because the truth is we all could do that it includes flow states so so the three factors again lost uh you don't have a sense of self it's very low effort and uh, you lose your sense of time. Now, one of the ways to get into flow state is understanding challenge and capabilities, Hmm. right? The two C's because we won't get into flow state. If for example, the challenge is too big and the capabilities to meet that challenge is too low, right? Because then you're just going to be stressed out of your mind. Challenge is too big, but your competency is too low, your capability. Now, if you reversed it, you're also not going to get in flow state because the challenge is too low, it's easy, and your Mm. capability is way too high. So you're just bored, right? So Mm. it's not going to get you into that flow state, that zone. So what we're looking for is a closer match where your capability and the challenge is there because it forces you to raise your alertness. Yeah. Right, you have to pay attention. You can't mail it in, but it's not so overwhelming because chronic stress will shut down different parts of your brain. It'll keep okay. you from not being creative and not flexible, not be able to okay. tap into your executive functioning. Okay. And so one of the ways to access flow is to challenge yourself in a way that your capabilities, and I, but sometimes you have to lower your challenge or up your challenge and up your capabilities also as, as well. Mm-hmm. But it can definitely be done by design. And there's also brainwave states that could also support this. So we have, if you're hooked up to an EEG to measure your brainwave activity, mm-hmm. there are four primary uh, brainwave states. There's beta, alpha, theta, delta. Delta is your sleep right? Beta yep. is when you're most alert, you're awake. What's interesting is in the two, the two brainwave states in between. So a theta state is a state right before you go to sleep. So it's slow wave state, but not so slow you're, you're resting, right? You're asleep. Okay. And so theta state is a state of creativity. And so by design, you could get into a theta state and be more creative to come up with ideas, to be able to solve problems. In fact, Einstein in, at Princeton would sit outside of his home and sit on a rocking chair and he, he would he would hold a rock or something mm. like that and he would do these thought experiments right where it's you know sitting on a beam of light and heading towards a clock and is the clock you know what does that look like from that beam of light kind of thing but he would hold the rock why because he didn't want to fall asleep because mm. if he fell asleep, he wouldn't be able to do access that theta state, but he just wanted to be right on the edge. You know what puts you in a theta state? 
showers, water, mm. running water. Have you ever noticed like when you're taking mm -hmm. a shower, you come up with some yes. more ideas and insights? Very much so. Yeah. I took six showers, Ed, right before just to prepare for this. <laughs> I can you. tell, brother. It's obvious. <laughs> but, the, but the water would put you in that theta state and that's a relate, relaxed state. So you don't have to wake up and say, oh, I hope I'm creative so I could write today or do my music. Mm. It's it's You know what it is? It's about taking the nouns in our life and turning them into verbs. So you mm. don't have flow. There's a process for getting into flow. You don't have motivation. There's a process for motivating yourself. You know, our mutual friend, uh, Brendan Burchard says, you don't have energy, you generate energy. There's a yeah. process for, for generating energy. And you mm. don't even have focus. There's a process for focusing. It's a verb. And the benefit of taking nouns and turning them into verbs, it gives you your agency back because you don't have to hope because hope is and not a really good strategy. You hope you wake up energized or motivated or focused. You don't even have a memory. There's a three-stage process of encoding, storing, and retrieving that you could actually memorize, right? And so mm -hmm. we have more power than we think. The last phase though, alpha is really interesting when it's related to flow because the alpha state where theta is where you're most creative, where information coming out, alpha state is a state of accelerated learning. So it's a state of relaxed awareness. And that's where they've done studies in Russia where they can learn languages faster and just by getting accessing this alpha state. And even that's how hypnosis works. Like a good hypnotherapist will put you in a relaxed state of awareness where your critical mind is set aside and you're just more susceptible uh, and to be influenced by mm. positive affirmations or new belief systems, right? Mm. And so that would put you in alpha state. Three things that everyone could do to access that brainwave state, it's visual, auditory, and kinesthetic. So visualizing and using your imagination will put you into an alpha state. Mm. Um, auditory, music, there's certain music that will put you into an alpha state. It's mm. not heavy metal and rap, it doesn't put you in a relaxed state of awareness, but uh, classical music, specifically we talk about in the Baroque, uh, like some of my favorite, if you're gonna make like a, you know, a playlist, uh, Baroque music from the Baroque era, it's uh, mm -hmm. Vivaldi, Handal, it's 60 mm -hmm. beats per minute. So mm -hmm. it, it harmonizes with the resting heart rate. So visual, visualize, auditory music, and kinesthetic uh, feeling based breathing. So rhythmic breathing with, with a longer exhale will put you into an alpha state. And isn't it interesting that some meditation processes use all three? You could visualize this mantra or this word that you're, or the candle, whatever you're visualizing. A good hypnotherapist will take you down an elevator or a set of stairs, visualization. And then they'll have people relax and do the breathing. And maybe they'll have sounds of nature or class in the background to put you into that deep state. And But instead of this hypnotherapy, uh, to be able to install new belief systems, uh, which is extremely uh, relevant and and, par and powerful and rewarding, you could do this for accelerating your learning. So you could you could you could put yourself in this state. So whatever is going on, you're listening to an audio book uh, or reading, processing something. All that information uh, will be better uh, retained because of it. Um, you guys, I love Jim Quick. I think I've said that today several times, and now you all know why I love him so much. I want you to go get Limitless, the expanded edition. He's given all the money away that he told you from the book. It's Jim Quick, which is K-W-I-K. -K. Make sure you're following my dear friend on social media, and everything that he creates and innovates is worth your time. That's why the most famous people in the world, he's their coach. Love Thank it. you so much. You know, mm -hmm. I love, happy, we have to have you back on our show also would, as well. I would love that, man. Our podcast. And yeah, mm -hmm. it's, it's just, I believe there's a version of everyone listening that's patiently waiting. And the goal is we show up every single day until, until we're introduced to that person. Bro, I love you. Thank you so much. All right, everybody, share today's episode. Max out your life. God bless you. <laughs>